the okay. webinar, and we're okay. just about ready to go. Hey. Welcome, everyone, to our ISA LDOT webinar, and my name's Rodney Jones with ISA. And I'd like to take this time to thank all of you for, for participating. I'd like to introduce our presenter. Our presenter is Eric Allen, and he is the Engineering and Operations Leader for Environmental Intellect, and he's supported more than 50 facilities in refining and oil and gas and chemical industries in the U.S. and China. Significant experience with LDAR editing, inventorying, retagging, turnarounds, and program implementation. Uh, furthermore, he's overseen the implementation of most rigorous third party QA, QC mandates for management of change under BP Whiting Refinery and enhanced LDAR programs. EI's team of chemical engineers and software developers to develop technology solutions to overcome the challenges that us face in the art industry. I'd like to also point out that he is a uh, presenter at the ISA Eldar 2015 Symposium. We're looking for his participant on next year's uh, event. I want to take this time to announce that next year's event is going to be held in Denver, Colorado. The ISA 2016 Eldar Symposium is going to take place at the Hyatt Regency Denver Tech Center. It's a very nice uh, symposium facility in Denver, Colorado. Uh, many of our attendees from the Eldar Symposium in New Orleans indicated that that was the next place to go. And we will welcome Eric back to the program so that he can present many of the uh, fine tech presentation that you'll hear today. I want to mention also that we're going to ask all callers, we're going to mute all callers so that he can present, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end. With that, we'll turn this portion of the webinar over to Eric. Mute. Eric, okay, well, I guess it looks like I'm getting thumbs up for my crew here. Everybody can hear me. Thank you very much, Rodney, for the introduction, and uh, appreciate the uh, I for for posting this webinar um, and and giving me the opportunity to present on this as well as the uh, uh, past ISA conference in New Orleans and looking forward to getting to uh, getting to Denver and presenting um, this thing this coming year's conference. Uh, I've got a lot of information. It's you know uh, it's funny you put together presentations on topics that you're really interested in and spend a lot of time on. You realize that you've got a lot to talk about. So. I'm going to jump into it real quickly. Uh, hopefully, we'll have time for maybe 10 or so, five or 10 minutes of questions and it's at the end of the presentation. But the topic we're talking about today are uh, retags, LDAR retags, and revalidations. Uh, I want to make sure everybody understands the difference between those projects. I want to focus a lot on best practices that you know we've all uh, picked up on uh, through the, the countless projects I've worked on and my colleagues have worked on, and also. Uh, I'm discussing about some new technologies that are uh, really empowering uh, people and professionals in industry to deliver best-in-class LDAR programs. So with that being said, the first slide, what are the typical challenges of a retag or revalidation project? I've listed a couple here that just about every project uh, we've I've had involvement with uh, have faced these sort of challenges, and I'll just list them real quickly. Project tracking and accountability. There's a lot of moving parts on these projects, so tracking the project and keeping everybody accountable to the work that they do can be challenged. Quality control is a lack thereof. A lot of folks focus on what they call QAQC and really QC part, the quality control part. If you get that right, you're going to really prevent a lot of wasteful rework. So quality controls is a challenge a lot of these projects. Deeper. All too often, all these projects are uh, the main communication for data is on paper, on PAs, on a master equipment list, and things we'll talk about. Paper is cumbersome. It's easy to lose. It's really not transparent for them. Merge tag history with new tag history. This is a really important compliance activity on tag projects. And depending on what dice you're using or kind of who your database administrator is, this can be a real challenge on these projects getting that done. Midlines and data. You've got a lot of eyes on your program, say, in a, in a particular unit when you're doing one of these projects. And these technicians are collecting really important compliance information in the form of, of, of red lines and, and notes. But if you can't make some of it, you can't collect it, compile it, and review it, you're risking a lot of valuable information. That's a challenge we typically see on these projects. Wasting time and money with intermediate unnecessary tasks. The technology that a lot of these projects are executed with 
requires a, a great deal of immediate and unnecessary steps. We'll talk about briefly, but and these include flagging cards and, and manual data entry, and this really wastes time and money. And ultimately, these projects are executed to achieve compliance. They would make inventory is accurate and compliant. And, and still, to this day, uh, we continue to see that this is a challenge on these retag and revalidation projects. So the difference between a retag and revalidation. Now, I'm assuming most of you know what a, a retag is. Um, maybe some of you have been through the process before. It's going to a, a process unit and uh, cutting off, you know, or sorry, hanging brand new tags on all the components in the, in the field, redocumenting those. And basically the way we like to think of it is, is starting over and doing it again. Uh, it does allow for complete resequencing of the tag numbers. If it's been many years since you've done a retag and had multiple MOCs, your tag number sequence may be order. This is by far the most common type of inventory project. And uh, subsequently, because of the great amount of work that's involved with this, it's also the most costly. A redation is a little lesser known uh, style of project. And the case for revalidation is, is you're not, not cuff all your old tags and hanging brand new tags. You're, you're revalidating and, and only hanging new tags and documenting components that have been previously overlooked. So basically, you're just fixing the issues. Um, this does not allow for complete resequencing of the tag numbers, but directly, you can actually reroute your components. And I'll talk about routing a little later on in the presentation. The lesser known approach. Uh, it can be completed for a lot less uh, time and effort and money than a than a a, a, a retag. Uh, however, there's there's new approaches that we're seeing industry uh, adopt to execute these revalidations to make sure that at the end of the day, after these projects, you're still getting the same compliant inventory out of the process. And uh, we'll talk about some of the best practices associated with that to ensure that a validation gives you the same outcome wise as a retag. Both retags and revalidations, uh, I, this note at the, I added this note at the bottom, should involve P&ID applicability review. That includes highlighting your P&IDs, field inventory review, and database updates. Tag or revalidation. Ultimately, these are uncompliance projects. The goal is to in, improve compliance. That includes an inventory accuracy. The physical tagging, which uh, not seem like a complex activity. However, uh, I know from my audit experience and knowing programs, if, if you've got a lot of comp tags that are missing in the field, uh, it becomes very difficult for the teams who are doing the monitoring and the repair folks who are doing the repairs to, to positively identify each component. So that's another complex activity associated with these. And also efficiency, route order and tag order. These are things that if you get route order and tag order wrong, can really slow down your technicians and ultimately cost your program money. Decision to retag or revalidate determined by how you answer the following question. We prepared a couple of those, a couple of questions you may want to ask yourself. You know, when was the last time you highlighted your PNIDs? Was it more than five years ago? Chances are there's been updates to those PNIDs that um, may be addressed to ensure your technicians have an accurate roadmap to do work off of. If you're subject to a consent decree, have your previous uh, party audits identified uh, any inventory related issues? And not just one off, we missed one valve, but uh, systemic issues. Uh, if your contractor has internal audit processes, which I see a lot of best contractors will actually have an internal process for inventory audits, are they consistently identifying? It? Are you being uh, notified that there's a bunch of newly tagged components uh, on an ongoing basis? Are you undertaking significant process in the unit? They require you to go out and re uh, tag those components. And uh, the last one is you're about to un uh, come under increased regulatory scrutiny, either enhanced enforcement priority from your region or your state, or potentially uh, coming under uh, the scrutiny of a consent decree and want to make sure you, you get inventory right before you sign that certification of compliance. Decision. When do you, uh, which, which way should you go? If you understand you want to uh, address your inventory concerns, which way do you go? Retag or revalidation? This is just a real general rule of thumb. Uh, we like to think of the 5% cutoff. If you do some, some study in your case studies in a particular unit and you find greater than 5% of overlooked components in that unit, a retag may be your best approach. That's because there's a significant enough level of, of components. Starting over and retagging might be the best approach. 
If it's less than 5%, you may be able to get by with just a revalidation, just patching over the things that are wrong. Of course, there's many other factors that influence this decision. Um, you know, order, efficient for the technicians and tag maintenance. You know, if you don't really know the answer to what, which way you want to go, talk to the technicians. They're the ones in the field that understand what needs to be done. They understand the challenges that the program faces. So having the discussion is really powerful. You know, this, um, you know, we want to, we appreciate everybody joining in and we, we want to make sure that we're sharing as much knowledge as we've collected over uh, projects in our careers on uh, these as possible. Some water. Um, we do want to, after the end of this uh, webinar, we will send out some resources to everybody who's attended, um, including checklists like this one you see here. Uh, really go through this if you've got an upcoming retag or revalidation going on to make sure that you and the contractor are aware of these best practices and uh, potentially can plan to implement these. And I'm going to go into um, a couple of these and subsequent slides and hopefully we'll uh, clearly define what each of these best practices are. And of course, if there's any questions during the presentation, wait until the end, or if you've got questions after you've uh, You've gone through this material maybe in a couple of days. Don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'd be happy to provide more information on these. Let's start re-highlighting the IDs. You know, we know that um, the CHA cycle is about five years where they're doing significant updates to the IDs. These are great opportunities to uh, immediately after a PHA when they revalidate the drawings to re-highlight your PIDs. And I bold and new was there because. If you go through the effort to to view your speciation and highlight your PNIDs, don't waste your time by using outdated PNIDs. Make sure you talk to the CAD folks and get the current up-to-date PNIDs. <clears throat> now, highlight your PNI or starting to highlight your PNIDs. Make sure you're sitting down with your process engineers and viewing applicability uh, uh, applicability of each of the streams that you've highlighted. So we like to use the rule of thumb that about nine, uh, 80 to 90 percent of the streams can be uh, correctly classified by that party or somebody who's not a process engineer in a unit. Those are the easy streams, but that last 10 to 20 percent, those are the tricky streams. That definitely requires a process engineer's input to get it right. So maybe you're sitting down, schedule some time with them to review those ability determinations to make sure them right. We've looked at a couple of things here, both for folks that are in the refining sightings as well as in the chemical side of things. Uh, some, some sticky points or some things that are always worthwhile to ask a process engineer's help on. Uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to provide more detail as to those, but for the sake of time, I'm going to move on. As highlighting your PNIDs, make sure you record the stream name on the PNIDs and make sure that gets copied over to the database. Uh, we can do a lot of folks that will just light their light liquid gas vapor and heavy liquid streams. Actually, take the time to write the stream names down, like you see the the lettering here on this example screen grab. Now, why is it important? All the databases that are commonly used uh, allow for you to put in this information in the database, and that's what drives the emission calculating, uh, relation and emission estimating. Um, more, your technicians, such as during a retag, will use this information and write it on the flagging cards to communicate it with the folks that are doing the documentation so it goes in the database. And ultimately, you want data systems that you have that go into our program to be aligned. The streams that are actually on the PNID should be the exact same as the ones that are in the database for those components. Another best practice is to write the tag number on the PNID. And you know, a couple years ago, five, 10 years ago, we saw a few folks that are doing this um, as uh, clients scrutiny uh, continues to uh, get more tight on the LDAR programs that we oversee, we're seeing more and more fee people that are taking the time to write tag numbers on their PNIDs. And it used to be kind of a, a nice thing to have, but more and more people are understanding that this is a really important compliance driving and efficiency driving activity. So we're seeing a lot of people that are doing this. You see a screen right here of uh, an example PNID. This is something that you can do with your existing even paper PIDs right here, such as this example. Go through that effort because it's one of the only ways you can ensure 
that all that effort you put into highlighting your PNIDs is mirrored in the inventory you get coming out of the project. Meaning that just because you highlight the PNIDs, meaning that if that's actually what's been tagged and documented in your database, if they write the tag numbers on the PNIDs, you're certain that there is uh, the, the true uh, program that you're receiving in database. Furthermore, there's there's plenty of uh, efficiency gains the CAD says so on the uh, the MOC front, as well as for uh, repair folks, we're seeing a lot of people that <clears throat> have these PNIDs with the tag numbers on it. When the work order and the repair needs to be sent to maintenance, so they just attach a version of the PID where the leak is. Very easy to do if you've got the tag number on the PIDs. At the end of this, with some of the technologies, some of the technologies we use to automate this process. Again, this is something you can do with your existing drawings right now. Now, the contractor accountability tracking side. <clears throat> we believe in trusting the folks that do work for us, but ultimately, we believe in the trust but verify mentality of these projects. And pardon me, I'm going to get another drink of water. Now, when we say trust but verify, you'll see the image here at the right. This is an accountability contractor productivity report that our software prints out. And you'll see this was uh, one that run about four days into the start of a project. And you see the, uh, the box, this is time in a day, and the colored dots for each day represent periods when that contractor was actually doing uh, documentation work. And you'll see some, some uh, I guess, discrepancies, some gaps in the middle of the day. It looks like their lunch break was about three or four hours, and it looks like they weren't getting into the field until about 8.30 in the morning. If by collecting this data and go through the effort to take to this review, we were to identify in a project like this that you know, the technician, they were trying to do the right thing, but there were some logistical challenges getting into the unit, getting a vehicle to go into the unit, uh, issues around lunchtime, uh, the operators were taking time off. These are things that only four days into the project, by doing this review, we were able to uh, identify and help resolve so that ultimately, was getting what they were paying for and spending all this time and money to make sure contractors are out there. So do what you can to keep your account, uh, your contractor accountable to the tricks they're tracking. Another best practice is weekly project status updating. If you've got a contractor that's doing your inventory project, they should be providing you a minimum weekly project status updating. We recommend tracking the, and the steps of drawing highlights Field flagging, tagging, documentation, and, and really depicting the numbers on a, a percent complete and a lot of time and materials contractors, so they should be able to give you a, a budget spent. Now, the reason why tracking is important is because you cannot accurately forecast a problem unless you begin collecting data and track it. So, backing it, it gives you an opportunity to identify if you're going to go over budget or over scope, uh, over schedule. So if you guys, uh, anybody on the line is interested in getting some good go-bys, uh, to hand to your contractor on an upcoming project, just message me afterwards, and I'll be happy to send you an example uh, workbook. But it is very, uh, the reason we do this uh, weekly project status updating, it allows you to make course corrections really early, early in the project. Entered operating procedures. This is a really important one. There's a lot of moving parts in these projects. There's the people that have involvement on these projects. So by documenting what you want out of your program, including the PNID flagging, ID highlighting, flagging, tag, and documenting, you can what you want out of the program and re providing resources to the project team that they use as a, as a go-by uh, to guide all the work that they're going to do during the project. Now, there's a couple important things that we like to include in these procedures we develop. Uh, I'm going to focus on the documentation side of things because, you know, a lot of things that go into how documentation is performed in your plant. And again, you may have a very experienced crew of technicians, but they're experienced because they've been to countless other plants. And then plenty of other things that they've picked up across all these projects they've worked on to your project. Well, there are many ways to do it, but if you don't have a procedure that tells them exactly how you want it done, 
you're probably going to get inconsistent data in your database. Furthermore, these operating procedures, you should use those to develop quality controls. And let's let's focus on documentation quality controls. You'll see a, a little animation here which shows one of the uh, a couple quality controls we have in our software uh, that are are a warning to the technician in the field whenever they're attempting to document uh, data that is inconsistent with the SOP that's been uh, for the project. Now the importance again of quality controls is it <clears throat> really improves the consistency of the data that's being collected. So more by you know simplifying from the, from the SOP you develop the documentation workflow, you're really minimizing the amount of time it takes for the technicians to make the decision on what data to collect. You'll see a lot of pick lists that we like to use is, is, a valuable, uh, is a very powerful tool, which really limits them to only using what you want them to use to document various fields, such as type and class and uh, manufacture. For uh, using quality controls can really prevent errors from persisting throughout your project. And without quality controls, you're left to quality assurance. And that's the project or as you're wrapping up the project you start finding all these bad data points very costly and time consuming to go out there and, and fix these issues um, you know ultimately by implementing effective quality controls you're going mitig to uh, mitigate end of project surprises and nobody wants end of project surprises other best practice is, is documenting detailed and unique locations descriptions. Uh, this is something that, again, um, I'm seeing more and more folks are starting to require unique location descriptions. And this, again, it's not just a nicety, it's become more of a compliance driver to have these. So is, if you've got utilized technicians to document countless non-unique uh, non uh, location descriptions, tags fall off. They, they do. Or maintenance folks cut them off. If by its two tags are lost that have the same location description, it is impossible to positively identify which component is which. Then you see a colorful uh, example location description. We recommend the four-point location description. You see that secondary reference point is, is what some folks will call the uniquifier. That really uh, is uh, a set of deviations that can be used to uniquify that location description. Of, you know, case of what happens if tags fall off, this great uh, uh, improves your ability to perform QQC because if the, the descriptions are unique, it's easier for you to go in the field and find the data that the technicians have documented. For, uh, I see a lot of folks that will send a location description with a work order for a component that's been uh, that's leaking. If you have a detailed location description, it's much easier for maintenance folks and repair folks to find a component that's leaking. Of course, this disclaimer at the bottom, you know, there's possibilities with a location description. There's a trade-off. The more detailed your location description, it does take your documentation technicians more time. So just make sure you think through exactly what you want out of a location description and dot it in your same operating procedure uh, to ensure consistency and productivity throughout your project. Another practice is to maintain a strict inventory during your retag and work on each tag gap. Most of the time you're ordering tags in sequential order, you know, a block of say tag 1,000 to 9,000 is what's going to be used in this unit. Your tagging technicians understand the importance of not losing a single tag. You know, if your documentation technicians are, are cutting off tags on over tag components, make save those tags. Because it's a project, you would hope that every tag that you don't have in the office that's been supposedly hung in the field is accounted for in the database. If it is, you'll see that there's a report below there or create a tag gap. So, um, a tag gap can't thing if you don't collect that and save the tags to account for it because it's a ghost tag. A tag that's been hung in the field but the documenters missed it and therefore is it's technically an overlooked component. So make sure that the tagging folks and everybody on the team understands the importance of saving any tags that are cut off. If you go the effort of, of viewing all those tags that you, you, you saved that have been cut off through the project, you find some that you can't account for in your database, it's the time to go out and do field review to make sure 
that those are not, in fact, ghost tags. Now about tagging. Let's minimize the occurrence of a tag. tagging. A tagging. A tagging. I've, I've kind of tried to simplify the understanding of, of what this is with a uh, uh, with a little image here, but but basically, what a tagging uh, a tag is created is if the taggers who are often uh, the, the least experienced Eldar personnel on one of these projects forget to uh, or, or miss a component, they don't hang a tag on it. Later, the documenters when they're documenting it uh, identify that component, and usually the documenters are the more experienced folks on the project. If component, instead of having the taggers come back out and uh, hang a tag on that, which would even be out of sequence. They instead just create a virtual tag. They add a, an A, a B, or a C after it. The nearby, the closest nearby physical tag, and and create this virtual tag. Now, the problem with this is it really can create a sloppy inventory. And, and when it comes to making sure that everything is tagged in the field, which is why you would do a retag for tag maintenance to resolve tag maintenance issues, it's a lot of physical tag gaps in the field. So to this, we recommend training your tagging technicians as much as you train your documenting technicians on component identification. But to have them pair them up in the first couple of days, if they're very inexperienced, with a documenter. It's definitely time well spent because they're going to learn things from the more experienced technician and understand the challenges that the documenters face in looking for and identifying components. The best practice, especially during a retag, is to record your old tag number and field verify to minimize title five deviations. Now, now, what I mean by this is if they're going through the effort to hang a new tag on a component, some or another, they need to main sh make sure that for every newly documented component, they record the old tag. Because this is the only way you can merge uh, the history, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Often, we do see folks that still today, <clears throat> instead of going through the effort of collecting what the old tag was, they will simply just cut off. Uh, they will simply just uh, innovate all those old tags and start from new. Of course, it's something that you know you've got inventory inconsistencies or component count inconsistencies. Uh, the Title V report often it gets submitted. We've increased our component uh, count by a couple hundred components or a couple thousand in a, in a, in a unit, and hopefully not a couple thousand. And really, you know, this is something that uh, the regulators and, and your the people reviewing your reports are really going to ask some questions about why increase your component count. Those components that were overlooked historically being a very low hanging fruit for a regulator to come and want to poke around with to understand what's going on with your LDR program. So, as recording the old tag numbers, make sure that the format for the old tag numbers is consistent with what's in the database. And I'll give you an example with the software we use that actually let the mission know, and we'll, uh, if they try to document an old tag that uh, is not actually in the database or is potentially the wrong format, so these ones that have the the U name and the dash I've highlighted, uh, definitely recommend. And this is a best practice as you're wrapping up the project. If you've got a bunch or you've got new added components that don't have a documented old tag, go there with the master equipment list of components that haven't been linked yet, and feel verify to see if you can potential Title V deviations. So urging tag history. You'll see a, a component edit uh, window here uh, from leaked off. Now that old tag that has been uh, documented, and, and don't just inactivate those old tags and, and add new components, but take the, the time to merge tag history to that new component. So you're actually just changing the tag number, that old tag, to the newly hung tag. Now the importance of this a over all of the inspections to that new Dominic component. In facilities that are subject to NSPS rules, you have the, the two consecutive months of monitoring requirement for newly added components. If you this, you have to basically re-monitor for two consecutive months all these components which you did not merge in that history. So this is creating a whole bunch of new work. Or, um, like we talked about earlier, if you don't uh, merge your tag histories, it really can cause over-reporting of potential Title V deviation. So make sure you're going through the effort of merging tag history. And I'll show you how one of the that we like to use uh, will actually automatically do this to make this an easy process. 
practice is to perform thorough data QAQC before updating the database. Uh, the database review, as many of you know, is becoming one of the EPA's preferred uh, enforcement uh, tools. It's easier for them just to request your database and review it than to actually show up at your plant. So make sure that the data that you're collecting and putting in the database is good data. You'll see a table here we've prepared of some of my favorite simple uh, QAQC reports as a screen grab of, of some software of ours that will update these, these checks. And you know, before you load that data into the database, you want to QAQC it because really once it gets into the database, it can be very, very difficult to make edits to, especially if you process the data. Uh, really, to make any sort of edits to the data, you're having to click through and edit individual component records and you can hundreds and potentially thousands of components. This is tens of hundreds of wasted man hours. Now, the topic of, of QAQC, and I can, if there's any questions afterwards, I can go into more details as to what these simple QAQC reports. But we all wanted to prepare a listing of some of our favorite advanced QAQC reviews that I've listed here. We'll send these out, um, but these are reviews that, that often aren't standard canned reports that you'll find in a database. These require a little more, a little more work to do, but if you do a couple of these and you find errors, it's, it's definitely a worthwhile review. I'll start with the the first one is one of my favorite ones. It's just a major equipment review. A lot of folks that don't do this. Off your highlighted PNIDs, you should very easily be able to uh, type a list of what major equipment such as pumps are in LDAR service and ultimately to be documented. Now, this involves doing that and also comparing it to location descriptions that are documented in the database. Make sure that every one of those pumps is referenced in location description and is ac actually documented in the database. This is an example of kind of a non-standard review. Um, we find these as being very, very powerful QAC reviews to perform. Now, the revalidation best practices practice. Make sure you field verify every component. So walk down individual routes. A lot of times, you know, people will misinterpret a revalidation as just being spot check QAQC. That's not the case. A true revalidation, during revalidation, you should be able to walk down every single component that's highlighted on your PNID and account for it in the master equipment list. You'll see, uh, here's a screen grab of, of, of a recent project of ours where the dots represent uh, valves that our technician actually revalidated. And you'll circled in red there. By checking off individual components on the PNIDs that have been revalidated, you identify those red circle valves like the one I showed here. As things that you need to back out and field verify. Is maybe the PNID out of date? Is that something that needs to be updated? Or is that actually something that the tech didn't revalidate and make sure is accurate? Another good thing, I have the uh, the printed out master equipment list. Um, Definitely recommend having your technicians go out with a copy of the master equipment list and checking off each and every piece of component, each and every uh, component that's shown on that list. So the project, it may come across components that weren't field verified. If your technicians are confident that everything, but there's still things in the database they haven't found, you definitely want to put some extra scrutiny on that to make sure you understand why they find it. Is that potentially a component that's not actually in the field? A validation best practice is uh, routing after we add a new component, routing it after a new by tag. Um, now, what is, I, I kind of mentioned at the beginning, what is what is route order? And I'm supposed to know what it is, but in case there's some people that don't understand what route order is, route order basically is a data field that most of the time you don't see in the database, but it's used to tell the monitoring technicians uh, which order to monitor components in. So in a, a standard handheld, they're only going to you know, they're going to submit one component, and the route order is based what the next component that pops up for them to monitor. <clears throat> if you don't get your route order correct, you're technically going to be wasting time wandering around the unit, bouncing back and forth. And important in a revalidation because if there were overlooked components that you're uh, documenting, the task is not going to be in line typically. Uh, and furthermore, the route order, such as this example, this lower left table, You'll see the route order that was created in this case was um, at the very, very top of the list, one of the last routed components. Don't fix this and allow the technicians to record which component they should route the newly added component after or before. 
they're wasting time. So there's different software uh, and hardware uh, technologies that can allow you to do this. It's very important if you want to achieve efficiency out of your monitoring routes coming out of a project. Now, another best practice is deliverables you receive from the project. You know, most people think that the only deliverables they should receive out of their project are highlighted PNIDs and an updated database. Yeah, those are the main drivers, but you really should be giving a lot more information. We recommend a, a, a product, uh, closeout report that documents a lot of the things you do here. here. And an overview of the work that was performed. The next one is really important, applic uh, applicability determinations that have been documented. If you're going to take the time to sit down with your process engineers and, and review your ability for the unit on each for each stream, dot that in a report that you can reference in, in later years because it's just not going to remember off the top of your head. Uh, responses to any data anomalies. I showed an example screen grab of a, a, a tag app report where we had responses to each of those. Those are great things if in the future you've got an auditor that does QAQ in your program and ask you questions about what are these data anomalies. If you document a response to each of these, you can explain those away. The documentation of QAQC that's been performed so you know what's been done, and, and if you want to do more QAQC, you know what they haven't been done that you may want to undertake. And some of the PNIDs and in the database. This is very important because you know, if you're just doing one process unit, uh, the next process unit you may want to do streams that carry over from that last process unit you did. So, so the name shouldn't change just because it's in a different process unit. It should hopefully be the same stream name. If you document what those stream names are, you can have a nice, real handy cheat to go to when you hide that next unit. Finally, we recommend a summary of drawings that were reviewed and highlighted and, and where they've been uh, recorded. If in the future uh, your CAD group gives drawings that maybe they uh, didn't send originally, you know exactly what you reviewed you know what you can go review against, so you're not having to read your project. You're just done with any added uh, drawing. So make sure that if you're doing one of these projects, your character is providing you and deliverables coming out of the project. We spent a lot of time. Or I've spent a lot of time talking about any leading uh, uh, BESs. But what technology? What are some technologies? Uh, on a technology front that are that are helping to implement these best practices on projects. Um, you know, there have been some breakthroughs in the hardware and software front that that allow for these to be implemented. Uh, you know, without additional time and and uh, expenditures, but really the, uh, something that the technicians want to, uh, or, or I guess, are empowered to do um, by the nature of the software and the tools they have in their hand. You'll see a, a picture here of a, uh, a tool we use. We call it a Field Tech Toolbox. It's a Microsoft Surface Pro 3 tablet uh, in an intrinsically safe case. And I'm going to talk about oh, how this Field Tech Toolbox running on Surface Pro 3, uh, doing industry-leading approaches to these retag projects. And it's really empowered technicians in the field. Now, it's chosen the Surface Pro 3 because of its, it's actually really, really device. Um, in comparison to like Android and iOS devices, um, this thing is a full functioning computer. Uh, and this is the computer that I'm presenting from today. Very powerful, a lot of memory and a lot of storage, which which gives the ability to send technicians in the field with not a loaded route, but we'll send technicians in the field with an entire backup of the data they use. Um, you know, we'll talk about merging tag histories and having access to all the information they need to do their job right. So I'm going to highlight a couple of simple uh, features of the, this industry-leading technology. I'm going to exit out of here because I've got some animations that hopefully can describe what some of these are. You know, I, I think I showed this before, but with software, we're able to actually predefine and load in all of those uh, SE uh, requests that we talked about earlier so that the technicians are actually notified uh, when they are about to document a component uh, or collect that data. And you'll see this, this scrap that pops up. This actually uh, looking at the data that all the technicians have documented so far, as all the location descriptions and the tag numbers informing the technician that they've vented that location description for. They've actually already documented that new tag and the old tag. 
This is just the way that we're able to use quality controls to and the quality of data coming out of these projects. Now about the power of these devices, it is um, something that empowers technicians when you're able to send them out there with complete backup of the database. You'll see in this animation that related button that pops up under the old tag, telling that there's actually, uh, when they type in that old tag to form that linkage, you're telling them that, that that has children components associated with it. And by that two related, actually pop in uh, those children components, which increases their productivity in the field. They're not re-documenting. They can actually just revalidate to make sure that those children are correct. Again, this is one of those things that and technicians to form that link between the old tag and the new tag because it makes their work efficient. That's how we help to minimize uh, Title V deviations of this software. For the QAQC front, I've got a little animation here showing how with a quick button, uh, this software allows us to QAQC. Um, this is before the database, the data's coming in from the field and actually make very simple edits to the data. Just in it and saving it and re hit and refresh QAQC, the, the, the issue that's flagged by the software has been resolved. Let me go back to my presentation. Those are just a couple examples of how the software we use and technicians on these projects. And ultimately, the goal of, uh, of the software in uh, all the industry leading software that are being developed is to practices to the project by empowering the field uh, personnel and making their work more efficient so that ultimately you're creating in, we're able to create industry leading uh, deliverables produce industry leading compliance and uh, deliverable uh, and deliverables so the things we want to talk about there's uh, tools out there that allow for automatic tag annotation and stream annotations on electronically highlighted PNIDs so the example you see uh, to the right about how um, by giving them the, the database backup, it encourages them to find that old tag, new tag link and not record animation on paper master equipment list when they're doing revalidation and the automatic QAQC report form. So what continues to guide our technologies that we develop? You know, we believe that LDAR inventory related issues are caused by tools and approaches that often accepted as industry standard. That's that's for an antiquated uh, hardware technology. We believe that paper and manual data entry are the enemy. Not only is it wasteful, but it produces opportunities for uh, error when you're manually entering your data or, or, or not really catch up that a technician wrote on paper. With this, we're able to leverage modern hardware to empower field personnel in the field. Not only do we believe that the technicians want to do a good job, but if you don't give them the right tools to do the job right, they're not able to do their job right. And also we believe there's a better way to do things. So that real quick overview of some of our technologies. Um, happy to have a more enhanced discussion around technology. But I think enough time here. I've gone over a lot of material real quickly, about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, are there any questions? I'd be happy to answer them. Let me unmute all the callers, Eric. Just give me okay. one second. Unmuted. Okay, I'll be unmuted if anybody has any questions. What well, requests are all right. Eric, this is Judy yeah. Wright. Uh, I have a question. In your presentation, you were talking about, uh, I think you called them orphan components or A, where you have missed a component and you set an A on the nearest number. Do yeah. you have a component that's added at, in the system, would you suggest as uh, an identifying process a new component? Yeah, so such as in a revalidation where they do find an overlooked component. And, uh, you know, I, today, what is my recommendation for documenting that? You know, if you're not able to 
to you know create custom printed tags uh, to fill in that tag uh, gap, such as you know you've got a, a tag five, a missing tag, and then a tag six. Um, if you can't create a, your own uh, new tag, it's okay to hang a tag that's out of sequence, but you want to make sure that, that you're taking time to document uh, and record a route number because all that route ID will, um, if you get that wrong, will slow down the technician in the field. So that's where that, that route after functionality um, really is, is powerful because, you know, even the tag number is out of order, as long as the route number is in order, the technician is going to know to monitor that component next and aren't going to miss it. Okay. Okay. Any questions? That was a good one. Hey, Aaron, have you seen facilities use isometric strings instead of pin IDs? And, and have you, you know, have an opinion on one or one versus the other? Yeah, a couple of facilities that will use isometrics. You know, I've seen I've seen both cases. I've seen uh, actually spent quite a bit of time at a facility where they had a, a tagless LDAR program, so they only documented virtual tags on their isometrics. Uh, I believe it was the uh, the former Enza facility that they were known for having uh, um, metrics in addition to their tags. And you know, I really think that it is definitely a way to, if you've got that case, to make sure that, hey, if a tag does fall, you know exactly what tag should be there. There definitely are challenges with isometrics. Um, it's a lot of information. You know, you're, you're depicting every piece of pipe on a typically 11 by 17 or eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. So, um, you know, we are at actually one facility where we're working with um, trying to electronify the isometrics so that they're going out there with a binder full of paper, but they're just going out with like a tablet that has the isometrics on it. I think it's very useful to have those if they've got, if you've got a, if you've got a significant enough CAD resources that they can maintain those. But, you know, through changes, to update your P&IDs as well as your isometrics, that does take a little extra time than just updating the P&IDs and going in the tag route. It can produce a lot of benefits. There are some, some challenges, and it does, you know, require some additional effort. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm seeing a couple facilities that have those. Hey, this is uh, Joe McHugh. For the facilities that do use isometrics, do they do the highlighting on them as well, or just with the uh, P&IDs? Uh, I have seen I've seen sites that will highlight both, um, especially when you're looking at isometric, especially around where where speciation will change, like a, I don't know, the top of a seal pod or something like that. Um, it's helpful to have it highlighted. Um, you know, also see at those same facilities, they won't go through the effort because a lot of the isometrics that you see, you know, there's no change in speciation. It'll just have a note on there that says everything on this is light liquid naphtha or something like that. Um, again, yeah, you know, that's another challenge with it is if you're gonna, you, you need to highlight your P&IDs on an isometric program because, you know, that gives you, the P&IDs give you a better understanding of kind of the, the speciation profile. A process engineer knows how to read those. You've got to mirror that over uh, onto your isometric. Challenges associated with that. Um, there are ways to integrate with uh, some of the new CAD technologies to uh, automatically generate. If you've got electronic highlights in your P&IDs, like what we produce, um, you there are ways to generate highlighted isometrics, but we haven't asked anybody yet to do that. But good on isometrics. Let's keep them coming. One more question, Eric. Uh, yeah. Have you had any experience with barcoding components and using barcoding in the field? Actually, you know, I just, um, on our website, I actually just put up a blog post uh, about some uh, regulatory insights and some Chinese regulations that are coming out where they're requiring barcode scannings over or code tags in China. Uh, from my experience in the states, at least, I see people that have them. A lot of people that will uh, utilize them to their full abilities, you know, requiring um, that 
the ring technicians actually can only document a component if they barcode scan it. That's ultimately what the folks overseas in China are looking for is a level of insurance that the technicians are actually at that component. <clears throat> the challenge with barcode scanning and all those are in, in, in requiring that is what do you do when a tag falls off? The technician may know this, uh, you know, what the tag is just because it's, you know, tag out that's in order. Um, but managing how they would override the barcode scanning um, is something uh, that I could see being a challenge. What's the I would say a few sites that use barcode scan tags, but not everywhere. What kind of have you? I saw the technology you had was, was developed by by your company. Have you seen what leaked us mobile? And the capabilities of that. Have you worked with clients that, that use that and and not, not technology? Yeah, we you know we've we've been following what leaked us and and, and guide where we're doing. Um, you know, we, you know, we put some content on a recent newsletter about this, or maybe the last newsletter. Um, a step in the right direction. We like it just because I mean the old Archer twos and even the Archers that a lot of folks use are just I mean they're ten twelve year old technology. You can't I mean, you go to a, a, a Verizon and try to buy one of those, they'll laugh at you because it's just such antiquated technology. So the, the move to a more modern piece of hardware is good. Now, that is, you know, that we see with Android and iOS is that, you know, that's very much optimized for like a cell phone experience. So they may be very powerful devices, but they just don't have the full, uh, I guess, customization that you can have with the software, uh, as well as the power. Some of the things that we're able to do with with Windows. So actually, the tablet that I showed, we just use a it's a Microsoft Pro 3 that runs Windows 8, very powerful device. And you know, I've seen a couple folks that are using the new version on an iOS of leaked off mobile on iOS, and they're running their PIDs out in the field um, on a little device, but they're not. The, the leaked DOS mobile is not integrated with the drawing. So the technicians are, are left to have to constantly flip between screens to on the drawing to actually document the component. And, you know, what the software I showed you is it, it, it gives them all that information in one view. So in the view of the drawing, they can draw in, they can access reference tag information, and they can document and, and new and even log inspections. Um, so, um, you know, I would say the, iOS and Android route is is a good step toward future, um, but you know definitely like the route we've gone with very powerful devices. That I mean, even powerful, it's still given you know eight to ten hours of battery life. Reason uh, the route we've gone with it. Is that your question? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. We have well, any questions from the participants? Somebody said that they were recording this uh, presentation. Is there anywhere the presentation or you know the presenter can get a copy to uh, to go forth if need to be? The presentation will be available on the um, LDAR page on the ISA website. Um, it should be available by Monday. Okay. And send out a link to all the. Um, um, the people that were invited to the webinar, I can send out a link, especially for those that were unable to end up you know, unable to attend. I'll make sure that that, that is available to everyone. Great. Yeah, and 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 for more, like I said at the beginning, um, we're going to work in the next couple of days to wrap up some of this content into uh, some checklists and like uh, project status reporting templates. So I think from for Rachel and Rodney, we'll get a, an attendee list with email addresses. We're going to work on. Send out that that information so you all have access to a checklist. Um, and, um, if anything come up um, on checklist, please know. Happy to answer any questions. Eric, and I do want to say uh, I appreciate environmental intellect and all the support of ISA Eldar activities. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us today. 
And mm-hmm. to the participants, if you'd like to hear more of Eric's presentations and his technical background, he's going to be presenting again at the ISA Eldar Symposium in Denver, Colorado. Uh, that's going to take place May 16th through 17th at the Denver Hyatt Regency Tech Center in downtown Denver um, in May. So please make plans to attend. We're going to be sending out formal information and a call for papers. And uh, we're excited about Eric's participation there, as well as a number of other speakers and EPA experts. Thank you so much for participating with us today. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. See ya.